All right, hello YouTube. So in today's video, I'm going to be sharing a few thoughts about this book here. It's called uh, Painting an Experience in 15th Century Italy. It's by uh, Michael Baxendall. It came out in the mid to late 70s, I want to say. Pretty um, influential text in cultural studies and in art history particularly. It's kind of like a uh, pretty standard art history textbook on the social history of art, kind of like innovated that particular methodology. You know, in art history, you have many different methodologies, many different approaches to doing historiography that you can take. And um, social history of art is just one of them. It's very often associated with Marxism. He's not doing anything that is explicitly political in this text, but um, just the the I like the method that he uses of looking at um, the social forces that you know are responsible for determining taste and like aesthetics and uh, the the concept of the period eye, which I'll talk a bit more about. Um, it's all very like uh, it fits neatly into the you know Marxist emphasis on looking at uh, like the material forces of society and how they determine um, like superstructural things like ideology and you know aesthetic taste. In this video, I'm just going to give like a it's going to be like a very informal video. Just going to like run through a few things that kind of stuck out to me from the book and share a few thoughts on it. But uh, I'm not going to, by any means, be doing anything rigorous. And in the video that I'm going to to release tomorrow, I'll do a follow-up where I talk more about, uh, you know, the social history of art in a broader sense and cultural studies and uh, try to talk about it in a more, like, kind of philosophical sense. So the, uh, the main thing that uh, Michael Baxendahl is really... Uh, remembered for like the really influential concept that he coined with this book is called the period I, which um like in the this book is made up of three chapters and the middle one is uh, you know the longest of them all and it's where he really elaborates the the his like uh, concept of the period I and um, he starts by talking about how you know, vision at one like very basic level is the is, it's like a biological function, right? And at, at very basic level, it is the same between all individuals. You know, it, like the light hits the retina, but then almost immediately, it it um, hits like a kind of um, subjective aspect of the brain. It needs to be interpreted by the brain, and at that level. Um, particular individuals begin to diverge in how their vision, um, you know, interprets uh, like, you know, basic empirical phenomena. Brains interpret light and um, our brains are formed by our overall life and you know, everybody, basically the idea is that everybody's vision is unique and the factors that go into making individuals' vision unique are culturally determined like um um you know he wants to say that um the vision of individuals living in 15th century italy are going to be very different from our vision today we see things very differently this diagram here which is a diagram from the 15th century it's not something that i think he might have touched it up a little bit just to make it more clear but it's based on um, like a church plan from, I believe, like a, like an Islamic church plan, I believe. I can't really recall off the top of my head. But uh, basically, the idea with that diagram is that depending on your life experiences, whether or not you, like he kind of makes a judgment about whether or not um, you're more trained, whether or not you have like a more trained visual sense or not. But if you have a more trained and like refined visual sense if you have more experience you will see this as a circle that is overlaid on a rectangle whereas other people might see it as a rectangle with like four kind of l-shaped uh, lines emerging out of it so the idea here i mean this is like a you know you get this idea in linguistics as well i remember studying a bit of um like universal grammar and uh the idea is that um you know, based on your life experiences, you interpret visual phenomena, which, you know, we might think 
are objective, empirical things that everybody would interpret and see alike. But in fact, our you know cultural upbringing, our life experiences, the kind of uh, you know society that we live in, ultimately determine how we interpret and parse visual data as well as auditory data. That's how um, you know humans are eventually able to uh, like parse like a stream of sounds as separate words and like begin to interpret them as such as language. The idea is that, um, you know, in the 15th century, uh, people, because they had such a different culture than we do now, they had, uh, you know, different taste. It's not the taste that comes first, but it's um, like everything else determines the taste, you know, which does fit into the our understanding of the base and superstructure dynamic where the economic base the material forces of society are what determine our things like um, ideology and religion and you know aesthetic taste like cultural uh cultural things okay, so that idea is pretty interesting it seems pretty true to me although he doesn't frame it obviously he's not um explicitly a marxist and he doesn't really use any marxist terms he doesn't frame it as a uh, like the di the dialectic between a uh, base and superstructure it very much fits into that and like a lot of what he's doing in this book is um talking about and like providing evidence for how um like extraneous social forces determined uh, the types of pictures that were being produced in the 15th century one example that really stuck out to me that i had no idea about that was very um, interested to learn about is how um, you know in 15th century paintings you have a lot of like hand gestures like very kind of deliberate positioning of the hands in various paintings like the Madonna and you know all of these uh, saints and whatnot um, they, they always have their hands in like very particular positions which I didn't really think anything about that I didn't really know that there is anything more to them. Influenced by preachers, in fact, and all of those hand gestures, all of those hand positions have meaning, they have significance, they express certain things, and, you know, the the origin of that meaning comes from uh, monks and preachers and, um, you know, orators, like religious orators, who are speaking in front of large crowds and use these kinds of hand positions to reinforce what they're saying, to like clearly and visually express whatever the theme of the sermon was. Another thing that he uh, really gets into is uh, the colors that were used in paintings like ultramarine, for example, blue, is actually uh, made from crushed lapis lazuli. It's not um, a gem that was native to Italy. Blue has a very high value. When you look at these kinds of paintings, um, and you see blue is always used to represent the Madonna, the, the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mother, because, you know, obviously she is a very important icon, and uh, you want to give extra significance to her by using such an expensive color. first chapter of this book, there are a lot of um, excerpts pulled from the actual contracts between uh, artists of the period and their patrons, where they were, you know, precisely detailing the value of the painting in terms of the pigments that were being used. The type of blue pigment could be um, specified to like various, you know, grades of uh, fine. Kind of like dilute it more and more to get more and more pigment out of it. But the more you dilute it, like the less brilliant the color is. So um, like the, these contracts would determine like the precise value uh, per ounce of the blue pigment that was to be used and then later on as the as the years wore on as the century wore on um, people started to shift their emphasis from things like the amount of uh, blue that would be used in the painting the amount of gold that would be used in the painting and in the frame and they would emphasize more and more um, the skill of the painter of the master painter and they would you know, the contract started to precisely lay out, like, uh, you know, how much time the master who is, you know, being contracted would have to spend as opposed to their many um, helpers. You know, these these painters at the time had, like, big workshops and they had a lot of helpers who would do a lot of the kind of more uh, monotonous painting of, like, the backgrounds and the landscapes and, like, the 
um, like the bottom half of the figures, for example, there are some contracts that say, you know, the master has to paint like the hands and the face, but then, you know, they could get their their uh, assistants to paint like the body, which was, you know, usually covered by clothing and yeah, that sort of thing. So that's pretty interesting. And um, it, it really, um, goes to show like and like support the overall thesis of the book which is that um you know like the the kind of elements the visual pictorial elements that build up these paintings like the position of the hands and the colors that are used and you know how the colors are applied to certain icons had uh, you know various hierarchies of importance so you know the colors would be applied to them accordingly and um yeah, it's interesting to see like how all of that is uh, like socially determined and you know it, it wasn't really like the artist some kind of like genius artist who is like coming up with these sorts of things like out of their head or whatever. The, the use of blue to represent the Virgin Mary was not some kind of like inspiration but rather it was the uh, results of like a real material economic desire to place like the highest value pigment on the icon who is you know most often uh, like the most important within whatever scene is being depicted like the Virgin Mary is you know generally um, generally she has like a lot of significance in in whatever painting that she might appear in um, yeah, so I think that's like, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting to uh, consider um, like how these kinds of social forces determine like the aesthetic taste of the time. The the primary audience of these images would be, you know, pretty well trained in mathematics. Um, he goes on to show how like the overall composition of these paintings and, you know, the arrangement of figures and elements in the various planes of the image would be um, recognizable by the audience as being mathematically determined. And like the size of the figures and, you know, again, like the, the composition in space, um, the audience would be able to like see that and, you know, they would immediately have like this kind of um, mathematical appreciation based on like a common training. You know, they, they'd have like a greater appreciation for the composition of the image. And again, like, like the argument is that the training in mathematics of the audience, the the kind of like social background, the society of the time is what determines the composition of the images. It is not like the artists who are, you know, painting these images and using these kind of complex arrangements of figures that then led to uh, men like learning math no that's obviously not the case that wouldn't make any sense it's the reverse that is the case it is the economic base that determined the uh like ideological superstructure it's like really interesting evidence for the dialectic between um base and superstructure so yeah those are just a few um examples that really stuck out to me when i was reading this book it's a very interesting book as I said, this was, I didn't want to do like a comprehensive essay or anything, kind of essay video about this book. I just wanted to share a few like things that kind of stuck out to me as interesting. I'm interested in art of this period, but I'm also, you know, trying to explore like a, you know, a particular way of doing art history and art criticism. I don't want to get too much into that now. As I said, I'm going to do a follow up to this video where I talk about that more generally, but, um, yeah, it's a really interesting book. I, I really recommend it if you want to learn more about this period. Because, like, the type of art history that he's doing, the type of research that he's doing, is less, like, formalistic. It's less, in, like, he does a lot of formal analyses of, like, quite a wide variety of paintings. Um, but his emphasis is less on formal elements of a painting, but more on the social background. So you can learn a lot about the paintings themselves, but you also learn a lot about the society that they came from. I'm interested in like exploring how to do kind of like a Marxist uh, or materialist or historical uh, study of art, of cultural object. I recommend reading it. I'm going to do a follow-up to this video where I talk more generally 
Um, you know, if you watch this channel, I will try to get more philosophical, more communistic about it. But I just wanted to do like a pretty, you know, informal overview of the book and share a few thoughts on it. So I'll see you next time.